The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Well, I think maybe the church, somehow we tend to forget the purpose and we've lost confidence in what we want to talk about this evening, the power of Scripture. Pat Robertson again, and I'm quoting him, he says, quote, The Bible is not an impractical book of theology, but a practical book containing a system of thought that will guarantee success. Wow. So theology is impractical. And what we want is a success manual. We're going to turn the Bible into a success manual. Unfortunately, we begin to define success as the world defines it. It's measured in quantity, not quality. And so we have the whole church growth movement, and, I, and I'm not opposed to large churches, but we have an awful lot of conversions and decisions, and I'm quoting one author who did a little investigating. He's talking about a, large, a major denomination in the United States. He said in 1990 it had an, an incredible 294,784 decisions for Christ, yet in 1991 they could only find 14,000 of them. There were 280-some thousand decisions for Christ that were unaccounted for. People who had gone forward, who had made a decision, but somehow they fell between the cracks. It didn't last. He says in 1996, the leading U.S. denomination revealed that in 1995 it had secured 384,000 decisions, but it retained only 23,000 in fellowship. It couldn't account for 361,000 of them. Another crusade, there were 600 decisions obtained, and the follow-up workers couldn't find any of them. He quotes Charles E. Hackett, the Division of Home Missions National Director for the Assemblies of God in the U.S., who says, quote, A soul at the altar does not generate much excitement in some circles because we realize that approximately 95 out of every 100 will not become integrated into the church. In fact, most of them will not even return for a second visit. That's shocking. He's talking about a crusade that was held in Leeds, England. A visiting U.S. speaker acquired 400 decisions for a local church six, six weeks later. Only two were going on, and they fell away. I don't believe in falling away. I believe in eternal security. I believe that Jesus said, I give my sheep eternal life, they will never perish. I don't think you can have eternal life today and you don't have it tomorrow. That'd be a strange kind of eternal life. So apparently these people were never Christians. He tells of another pastor who traveled to India every year since 1980. He said he saw 80,000 decision cards stacked in a hut in the city of Rajamundri, the results of past evangelistic crusades. But you couldn't find 80 Christians in the entire city. And they'd had 80,000 decisions. Now, we're talking about the power of Scripture. The Word of God says that the Scripture, of course the Gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And Peter says it is by the Word of God you are begotten by the Word of truth. So somehow we're using methods and techniques. We've abandoned sound doctrine instead of relying upon the power of God and his word and the gospel. We've got methods and, 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 and techniques and so forth. In the, in the charismatic world, you have the signs and wonders movement. John Wimber is generally considered to be the, the founder of the signs and wonders movement. I don't have time to talk about it. The Toronto blessing, I've been to Toronto, I've seen them crawling around the floor making animal noise and so forth. Pensacola, I think I mentioned to you that I've watched hour after hour after hour of the videos. I've never heard the gospel presented clearly. There are hundreds of people going forward to get some kind of an experience. They want power. Benny Hinn tells how when he saw Catherine Kuhlman, he said he had to have that power. Well, he says that he goes to the graves of Catherine Kuhlman and Amy Semple McPherson 
And that's where the Holy Ghost is lingering, and that's where he picks up the power of the Spirit. But his books about the Holy Spirit are bestsellers. I watched Benny Hinn live on TBN. Paul and Jan Crouch are laughing uproariously. Benny Hinn is laughing uproariously, and he's telling how he touched this man's forehead, and he fell over, and his wig fell off. And the man put it back on and stood up, and Benny says, I knocked him down five times just to see the wig fall off. Ah, ah, ah. And they're just laughing uproariously. That is, that's the power of the Holy Ghost. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. He knocks people over to see the wigs, their wig fall off. No, that's not the power of God. But something is going on out there. And I don't want to get off on a whole thing about that, but I would like to read you something. I'm reading from page 519. And I thought you would find this of special interest because we're quoting Jack Deere, Dr. Jack Deere, who was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary who got involved in the Signs and Wonders movement. This is called power evangelism. And the idea is that the Word of God is not powerful enough. The Gospel doesn't have the power that the Bible says unless you have signs and wonders along with it to convince the people. Well, I believe in miracles. The Bible is full of miracles. But the Bible never tells me that it's miracles that, cause, that make people believe. Now, if you want to go to John chapter 2, it says when Jesus was in Jerusalem on the feast day, many, seeing the miracles that he did, believed in his name. And it says Jesus did not commit himself to any of them because he knew their hearts. And he knew that they were not truly his followers, that they wanted to follow him for the wrong reasons. And you know that nobody saw more miracles than the children of Israel, did they? Red Sea opens up before them. They walk through on dry land. God speaks with an audible voice from Mount Sinai. A pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire literally lead them every step of the way, tell them where to stop. They get water out of a rock. God speaks with an audible voice from the mountain. No, if you want to talk about signs and wonders... No one saw anything like this. And yet, God says, they're the most rebellious, disobedient people on the face of the earth. He said in Psalm 81, all the day long, I have held out my hands unto a disobedient and rebellious people. Well, Dr. Jack Deere, he left Dallas Theological Seminary after 12 years on his faculty to become the leading theologian in John Wimber's Vineyard Movement. He was interviewed, I'm quoting from an interview by Graham Bannister in Sydney, Australia. In fact, my wife and I were just leaving uh, Sydney when John Wimber and his team were arriving at, at this time. And 5,500 church leaders showed up, paid $150 each to be there for a Signs and Wonders seminar. And let me just uh, quote from Graham Bannister. This is his interview with Jack Deere, former Dallas Theological Seminary professor, he says, after introducing myself, I said to Dr. Jack Deere, I wonder if you might tell me why you felt my explanation of the gospel was defective yesterday. To which he replied, I'm really not very prepared to talk about that. I was a little surprised, considering that he had just finished speaking to 5,500 people and had informed us of the many ancient languages in which he had become proficient in order to fully understand the Bible. I wouldn't have thought that someone with such impressive credentials would need to do all that much preparation for a friendly discussion on the content of the gospel. I then asked, well, just off the top of your head, what do you think the gospel is? Jack Deere replied, I'm not prepared to make a formal statement about that. So I asked, could you perhaps tell me informally what you believe to be the gospel? <laughs> uh, Jack Deere answered, I'm not sure. Somewhat stunned, I said, I find that quite surprising that you're not sure what the gospel is. He replied, I used to be just like you, thinking the gospel was simply justification by faith. I responded, are you saying it's more than that? What would you add to it? Deliverance, he said. Things like demons and healing. I said, you would add as an essential part of the gospel the exercising of demons and healing? He nodded. I continued, like what John Wimber was saying last night? Yes, he said. But you're not sure exactly what should be included, I asked. No, he said, not yet. Would it be fair to say, I asked, that you're in a state of flux since you joined the Wimber thing? He quickly responded, we're always in a state of flux. You are. 
But on the gospel message, I asked, continuing to be amazed, I said, are you saying that you couldn't go back into that pavilion and tell those people the gospel? He replied, no, not yet. I responded, when do you think you could do that? He said, maybe five years, maybe 10. I remained stunned that one of the leading minds, if not the leading theological mind in the Signs and Wonders movement, did not know what was the gospel. Because they're looking to signs and wonders. And it's not the word of God, but it's these other imp impressive things that people are attracted to and supposedly are drawing them to Christ. But in the non-charismatic world, I want to just quote, once again, just a brief excerpt from David Wells. Remember his book, No Place for Truth, or Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology? You might get a copy and find it interesting. You remember, he was analyzing Christianity today as it moved down through history. And he said, quote, in three decades, CT, Christianity Today, had moved from a doctrinally framed faith, the central concern of which was truth, to a therapeutically constructed faith, the central concern of which was psychological survival. Thus was biblical truth eclipsed by self and holiness by wholeness. And then he goes on and he talks, we quoted this morning or yesterday morning, I can't remember when, about leadership. A highly successful journal designed for the clergy that was launched by Christianity Today in 1980. Remember? He says, since this is an evangelical publication, it is quite stunning to observe that less than 1% of the material makes any clear reference to Scripture, still less to any idea that is theological. The articles are single-minded in their devotion to the wisdom that psychology and business management offer, and apparently as equally single-minded in their skepticism concerning what Scripture and theology offer for addressing the practical crises of pastoral life. And you would have to ask yourself, what happened to the Holy Spirit? What happened to the power of the Word of God? Now, somehow we've lost our confidence in the power of Scripture and in the power of the Word of God. Let's just turn to 1 Peter and read a few verses there and see what Peter has to say. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I can guarantee you, if you are born again by the word of God, <laughs> that lives and abides forever, you have a solid foundation. And the Bible doesn't change, and you will not change. You know you're, cha you're saved for eternity. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And you know what Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Unfortunately, I think we have a misunderstanding, popular misunderstanding today. You know, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, Paul talks about those who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people, especially the charismatics, who say, yeah, by power, it means the power of miracles, and power of evangelism, and signs and wonders. No, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The word of God, the word of truth that converts the soul, as Psalm 19 says, and we read this morning. This is the power of God, and this is what we need to teach and, and to preach. As Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. But unfortunately, we've gotten away from that, tragically. Well, the Bible also, we're talking about the power of Scripture now, it also has the power to judge. Remember, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. The word, this is from John 12, 48. The word that I have spoken will judge him. 
in that day. Turn to, since we're so close, go over to Revelation chapter 20. Let's read from verse 11. We're talking about the power of the word. And that includes the living word of God. I'm sorry, Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were with him in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And of course you know this is the Word of God. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Power to judge, power to perform God's purpose and his will. John 1, in the beginning, was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. The worlds were framed by the Word of God. Power to establish, to cleanse and unite the church. And turn back to John 17, because now we come to another serious problem, I believe, in the church today that we would like to address as quickly as we can, and that is unity. <laughs> Power to establish the church, to cleanse it, to unite it. In John 17, you know, this is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so forth. That's called the Lord's Prayer. As you know, that's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord never prayed that prayer, did he? Because part of that prayer is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that would be altogether improper for Jesus, even as a man as he walked this earth, to pray that prayer. The, he said, after this manner pray ye. So this is not the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer that the Lord gave to his disciples, but he didn't tell them to recite it by rote. He didn't say, these are the words, repeat them over and over. He said, after this manner pray ye. It's a pattern of prayer. But the Lord's Prayer we find in John 17. And he lifts up his eyes to heaven, and he prays to his Father. And we don't have time to go over this chapter, but he is praying that they might be one. He is praying for unity, and I believe that Christ's prayer was answered. And notice what this unity, where will this unity be? It doesn't do any good to unite around a lie. The unity is, look at the end of, of well, read verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. They have kept thy word. Notice how often God's word at verse 8, I've given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Verse 9 is an interesting one. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse 11, I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, keep them through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 14, I have given them thy word. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then he says he sent us out into the world, and his prayer is for those, verse 20, which shall believe on me through their word, not the word that they make up, but the word of God which they preach, that they all may be one. Now notice this. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all may be one in us. The glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. I think it's pretty clear that the oneness, the unity that Jesus is talking about is a unity in the family of God on the part of those who have believed his word and by the word of God have been begotten into his family. And they are to be one as I am in you, Father, and you are in me, and I am in them. And it never in the Bible does it tell us to make unity. The unity has been established. And so you know Ephesians chapter 4 
we are told to keep the unity, keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That unity, how do you disrupt unity? I've had verses misquoted at me so often. And one of them is Romans 16, 17. And I've had so many people say to me, brother, the scripture says, mark them that cause division among you and avoid them. And we're going to avoid you because you're causing division. I said, why don't you go back and read that verse again? That's not what it says. It says, mark them which cause division among you contrary to the doctrine you have received and avoid them. You don't cause division by standing for sound doctrine. You cause division by introducing false doctrine and by refusing to be corrected doctrinally. That's where the division comes from. Jesus says you are united in the truth. You're united in my word. And you're united by my spirit indwelling and by my indwelling as the Father is in me and I'm in the Father and I'm in you and so forth. But the tragedy of our day, we've turned from the power and the truth of the word to unholy alliances, trying to make unity. And this has led into ecumenism. And ecumenism has led to a lot of problems. I want to quote you from the New York Times. Now, this was when ECT, Evangelicals Catholics Together, you remember that document? First came out, The Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. The title is very clear. The title says it all. It doesn't say some evangelicals and some Catholics. It doesn't say evangelicals and Bible-believing Catholics. It says evangelicals and Catholics. All evangelicals and all Catholics together. Together in what? The Christian mission in the third millennium. What is the Christian mission? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so that document says, I'm quoting it verbatim, we thank God for the discovery of one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. That would have shocked Martin Luther. It would have shocked John Calvin. But let me tell, read to you what the New York Times said. It explains how this whole thing got started. Quote, they, that is evangelicals and Catholics, toiled together in the movements against abortion and pornography. And now leading Catholics and evangelicals are asking their flocks for a remarkable leap of faith to finally accept each other as Christians. I would say that is a remarkable leap of faith. You know that the United Nations has a Hindu guru. He leads weekly meditations. This is Sri Chinmoy. He's established about 80 Hindu ashrams uh, around the world. And Pope Paul VI, who closed Vatican II, said to Sri Chinmoy, your message and my message are the same. And now we have leading evangelicals saying to the Pope, yes, and your message and our message is the same. And we thank God for the discovery of one another as, as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. You know that Pope John Paul II is the leader of an incredible uh, ecumenical movement. You remember he gathered in, and I don't know if the bookstore uh, has any of our videos. We may, and not only do we have the book, A Woman Rides the Beast, where we document a whole lot more than we can talk about this evening. But we have a video. And on the video, you will see the Pope sitting next to the Dalai Lama, his close friend, and, and the, the Buddhists and Hindus and so forth. The Pope gathered in Assisi, Italy, 160 leaders of the world's 12 major religions. Who was there to, to pray for peace? Who was there? Snake worshipers, literally snake worshipers, fire worshipers, spiritists, animists, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, North American Indian witch doctors, and they're painting feathers and fetishes and rattles. And in the video, you will see them coming to the microphone to pray for peace. And on that occasion, the Pope said, we're all praying to the same God. And our prayers are creating a spiritual energy to bring about a new climate for peace. And on that occasion, he allowed his good friend, the Dalai Lama, to put the Buddha on the altar in St. Peter's Church there in Assisi and have his Buddhist worship ceremony there with the cross sitting there as well, while the Shintoists were tinkling their bells and chanting and so forth. Uh, I don't have time to go into the ecumenism that is going on today. We have evangelicals now. I mentioned that the Southern Baptist Convention has been in dialogue with the Catholics for many, many years. So have the Assemblies of God. So have the Lutherans. 
while the Catholics are in dialogue with the Buddhists and the Hindus and with everyone else. What is wrong with ecumenism? And what is wrong with evangelicals and Catholics together? Can you give me a few more minutes and let me try to give you just a quick education? Because I can tell you that uh, years ago, 15 years ago, I didn't understand of this. I didn't understand what Roman Catholicism was. I had never studied it. This is a scapular. In case you're not an ex-Catholic, you wouldn't know what this is. The Pope has worn this since childhood. He still wears it to this day. The scapular on this end says, whosoever dies wearing this scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. Well, let me ask you it's a simple question. Anybody who wears this scapular in reliance upon that promise, have they believed the gospel? Do you need to wear a scapular? No. Jesus Christ, what did he say? John 5, 24. You believe, you hear my word, and you believe on him that sent me. You have everlasting life, and you shall not come into condemnation. You have passed from death to life, right? So if, if you wore a scapular, you don't believe that. Jack Wurtson, a couple of years before his death, he sent me. Now this is a New York Times, out of the New York Times, and Jack thought I would be interested in it. And in fact, he had some correspondence with Cardinal O'Connor about this, which is also included here. New York Times is quoting Cardinal O'Connor uh, there from St. Patrick's Cathedral in, in New York. And listen to what it says. This is the Cardinal speaking now. This is not me, a critic. This is the Cardinal speaking. Quote, church teaching is that I don't know at any given moment what my eternal future will be. I can hope, pray, do my very best, but I still don't know. Pope John Paul II doesn't know absolutely that he will go to heaven, nor does Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Now, you heard a lot about Mother Teresa standing up to the Clintons at that prayer breakfast, standing up to them about abortion, but you didn't hear what else she said on that occasion, and I see that I didn't bring the exact quote, so I'll just paraphrase it for you. Mother Teresa said, well, you know what Mother Teresa said, and we document it for you in, in, in a number of books. Mother Teresa said, all I'm trying to do is draw you closer to God as you conceive him to be. Whatever God is in your mind, that's what you must accept. If you're a Buddhist, I'll help you become a better Buddhist. If you're a Hindu, I'll help you become a better Hindu. If you're a Muslim, I'll help you become a better Muslim. And at the prayer breakfast, Mother Teresa said, you know, it is so difficult traveling and publicity. And if I don't get to heaven for any other reason, I'm just hoping that this has purified me. All this suffering of traveling and publicity has purified me and made me worthy to get to heaven. Well, you know that that's not going to get her to heaven. We need to understand just a, a little bit, a little bit about what Roman Catholicism is. Do you know that in 1545 to 1563, for 18 years, the leading Catholic apologists, not apologists, I'm sorry, leading Catholic theologians met to discuss the concerns raised by the Reformers. The Reformers said, sola scriptura. That was one of their cries. We need to get back to the word of God as our authority. Council of Trent, reject it. Sola gratia. Salvation is by grace, it is not by works. Council of Trent, reject it. Sola fide, it is by faith, it's not by works. The Council of Trent rejected. And the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent contain more than 100 anathemas, damning every evangelical to hell. You say, well, why are you talking about this 450 years ago? Because in 1995, in December 1995, the Pope had a, a ceremony honoring the opening of the Council of Trent, 450th anniversary, 450th year anniversary, and the Pope said, all the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent are in full force and effect. Furthermore, Vatican II, the latest council, and I'm quoting it verbatim, says, quote, this sacred council proposes again all the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, okay? And Vatican II contains its own anathema. It says, the church teaches 
that the practice of indulgences, and this involves purgatory, is to remain in the church. And it condemns with anathema anyone who dares to say that this practice is not to be maintained. You are anathematized. You are damned to hell. Let me just give you a couple of these anathemas from the Council of Trent, which are in full force and effect today. Whoever says that the sacraments of the new law, what is the new law? You ought to have this on your shelf. It's the code of canon law. It's about that thick. It's a large book. It's the codification of all the canons and decrees of the councils down through history. This is the final authority. This is the highest authority, the Roman Catholic Church. This is what you must live up to. By the way, I was having, uh, I don't think I, I mentioned this uh, here, I was having a debate recently with a Roman Catholic, and I asked him, could he give me the six holy days of obligation? Did I mention that earlier? Uh, oh, I did. Okay. And uh, he couldn't. And you know, the problem is that if you don't go to Mass on any of the six holy days of obligation, that's a mortal sin. You're in hell. That's not purgatory. And the only way you can escape is to come back and confess it. And if you don't know which are those holy days of obligation, how are you going to confess it? We've got an awful lot of Catholics. I like to tell Catholics, I mean, I want to be solemn with them and say, look, you say you don't believe in indulgences and purgatory. Your church doesn't athletize you. Your local priest or bishop doesn't have to read you out of the church. You have been damned to hell by the highest authority of your church. And there's no hope for you unless you come and you confess to that sin and you recant and you embrace what the church teaches about this. You're not even a Catholic. You can go to mass, you can go to confession and so forth unless you confess that sin. You are lost forever. And then I like to just solemnly say to them, maybe they shrug their shoulders, and I say, well, if you don't fear the church's anathemas, then why do you believe its promises? If you don't fear its anathemas, why do you believe its promises? Why do you believe the promises that it makes of getting you to heaven if you don't fear its anathemas of damning you to hell? Why is it any more right on this than, than it is on that? It's a solemn thought because we have evangelicals now who are joining forces with Roman Catholics. Here's the situation. You say, well, wait a minute. I talked to my Catholic neighbor or my Catholic friend or relative or whatever, and they believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried, rose again, and is coming again. Wait a minute. That's not the problem. The problem is what else they believe. And this is what the church teaches. I just quoted it to you. Whoever, oh, I didn't finish quoting it because I got off on the code of canon law. Sorry, let's get back to it. Whoever says that the sacraments of the new law, okay, those are laid out for you in the code of canon law. Whoever says that the sacraments of the new law are not essential to salvation, but that without them, through faith in Christ alone, a man can be saved. Let him be anathema. Did you hear that? You dare to say, you evangelicals, you dare to say that you can be saved through simple faith in Christ and his finished work upon the cross, and you deny that you have to participate you refuse to participate in the sacraments of the Catholic Church, and you deny that salvation comes ex opere operato. It's another one of the terms in the very act itself. Whoever denies that the sacraments offer or present or distribute grace, ex opere operato, in the very act itself, and anathema to you, you deny this. And you think you can get saved by faith in Christ without the sacraments of the Catholic Church? Anathema to you. So the problem for a Catholic is... A Catholic believes that Christ died for their sins, but they can't get to Christ. The church stands in the way. And the church says the graces and merits that were won by Christ on the cross, and I'm just quoting now from Vatican II, have been deposited in a treasury. And to the, the, the graces and merits of Christ have been added the graces and merits won by Christ the Virgin Mary, through her prayers and good works. And to that has been added the surplus of good works that the saints accumulated 
They earned their salvation with their good works, but they had a surplus. And that surplus was also put into this treasury. And it is from this treasury that the church dispenses graces. You come to Mass, we'll give you another installment. You say the rosary, we'll give you another installment. But as Cardinal O'Connor said, you're not saved. And you don't know when you will get saved. And this is why a friend of mine, well, here, this is a Mass card. Call any mortuary. They all have Mass cards. There are various versions of them, but this particular one says, In Memoriam, with the sympathy of, and you fill in your name, the holy sacrifice of the Mass will be offered for the repose of the soul of, you fill in the name of the deceased. This is not Middle Ages, folks. This is today. You give that with an offering to the priest. He will put it on the altar when he says Mass, and that will supposedly reduce the time of suffering for that poor soul in purgatory some unspecified amount of time. Even the Pope can't tell you how much. So you have to offer Mass after Mass after Mass after Mass. In the Catholic Church, they talk about this poor soul. She has no relatives. She had no children. She was unmarried. And she has no surviving relatives to, to offer Masses for her. How is she ever going to get out of purgatory? And, and a friend of mine, his father died recently, and he said, uh, a Catholic father, he said more than $2,000 in Mass cards were purchased at the funeral. So you have to say mass after mass after mass because it comes out of this treasury. It comes in installments. You never get saved. In fact, that's an anathema. You dare to say that you know that if you died right now, you would be absent from the body, present with the Lord, anathema to you. Even the Pope can't say that. The Pope doesn't know that. Well, we have evangelicals who are denying this, who are embracing the Roman Catholic Church, Charles Colson, as you know, he just stepped down and he put a Roman Catholic in place at the head of the prison fellowship, 80% by his own words. 80% of the counselors in prison fellowship are Roman Catholics. His book, The Body, it was a call for a union with Rome. And in that book, he said, the Catholic Church is no longer involved in indulgences. I sent him the 17 pages on indulgences from Vatican II. There are 20 rather complex rules for gaining indulgences, and he has not changed that book. I want to just mention a, a couple of other things as quickly as I can. Promise keepers. Uh, I'm not trying to run down promise keepers. I believe these people are very sincere, and I'm sure that uh, many uh, people who have attended, their lives have been changed. They've become better husbands. Some people have gotten saved. But we do have a couple of problems with Promise Keepers, and I just want to mention them as gently as I can. First of all, Promise Keepers is not a new movement. Perhaps some of you know that Promise Keepers is about 3,500 years old. Promise Keepers began at the base of Mount Sinai, where God gave them ten commandments, and they all promised to keep them. There is, and I'm not trying to be funny, there is nothing wrong with the ten commandments. The problem is we can't keep them. So I don't think seven more are going to help. And we have some specific problems with those seven. Let's take promise number six. We will not recognize denominational barriers. Well, I think you know that there are some apostate Protestant denominations. And some of these denominational barriers are there because of very serious doctrinal differences. And promise number five says, I will go back and I will support my pastor and my church. Well, maybe we've got a man sitting in the audience, if you're up in the Northwest, or maybe a number of men who are from First Baptist Church, downtown Seattle, Pastor Rodney R. Romney, who denies everything in the Bible. One of his books is titled, Journey to Inner Space, Finding God in You. And he's into Buddhism and so forth. But promise keepers, you're in the audience, and I pledge, promise number five, I will go back and I will support my pastor and my church because the problem with promise keepers is you can't say that anything is wrong. You can't contend earnestly for the faith. You can't contend for sound doctrine. You can't say, wait a minute, there are some problems, but we're trying to ecumenically gather everyone together. And you probably know that they recently, well, it's a couple of years ago, in fact, I have, if anybody wants to look at it, this is our Sunday visitor. This actually was in 1997, front cover Promise Keepers, the, the cover article 
a, a two-page spread on the inside is telling you how Promise Keepers and, and Catholicism work arm in arm and how Bill McCartney intended full Catholic participation from the very beginning. And it also tells how Promise Keepers revised its, its doctrinal statement to satisfy Roman Catholics that they use a Roman Catholic evangelist and that they also have a Roman Catholic on their board. Now, I could tell you a lot more about Catholicism, but I think I probably told you enough to recognize that there are some very serious problems. And you need to pray for your Catholic friends or neighbors or whatever and recognize that they're looking to their church. In fact, whoever says that there's salvation outside of the church, anathema to you. The church is absolutely essential to salvation. In fact, in case you are not aware of it, there's an anathema pronounced for all those who will not give submission to the Pope because that is declared also to be essential to salvation. Well, we read this morning from 2 John that all those who abide not in the doctrine of Christ, they do not have the Father, they do not have the Son, we're not to have fellowship with them, we're not to bid them God's speed. Instead, we should preach the gospel to them. And the Roman Catholic Church does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. And we mentioned just briefly, and I, and I, and I will close with this, we, we mentioned very briefly this morning about the Mass. Remember we read in 1 John 4 that the doctrine of Christ says that Christ came once and for all in the flesh. And the Mass denies that. The Mass says this little wafer is transformed into the body and blood of Christ. He's supposed to be in a resurrected, glorified body at the Father's right hand. No, he comes onto Catholic altars again and again and again. He is, this is the literal word, immolated, immolated on our altars. And let me give you just one more anathema, because here we have a major problem. You remember President Clinton, when he was in Africa, some Catholic priest down there allowed him to partake of Mass. Do you remember that? And it created quite a stir. And Cardinal O'Connor in New York, he got very upset. Why did he get upset? And Promise Keepers says, we're looking forward to the day when we will all partake of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, evangelicals and Catholics together, we will all partake of it together. What does the Roman Catholic Church say? A Roman Catholic is absolutely forbidden, forbidden to partake of a Protestant communion. And a Protestant, never mind evangelicals, a Protestant is absolutely forbidden by law to partake of a Roman Catholic Mass. Why? And you wouldn't want to partake of it. Why? Well, let me give you one more anathema. Whoever says, and maybe I think we mentioned it this morning, whoever says that the sacrifice of the Eucharist is merely a commemoration of a sacrifice that was completed by Christ upon the cross 1900 years ago and denies that this is an ongoing propitiatory sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the living and the dead, let him be anathema. When you take the bread and the cup, you dare to say that Christ finished the work on the cross and that you are remembering a finished work that wrought your redemption? anathema to you. This is a sacrifice. And it is propitiatory sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the living and the dead. And this is why the Catholic comes again and again and again, because they get another installment of forgiveness, another installment of grace. They think they're ingesting Christ into their stomach. It's, it's a tragedy, folks. And we need to recognize what they really believe, and we need to love them enough to give them the gospel. It's not, not easy. Some people think that, say, my book, A Woman Rides the Beast, is, is just too confrontive. Well, I can tell you that the first person that I know of that that book was given to by a friend of mine was his mother, who was a staunch Roman Catholic, married to a man who was part of the Sicilian Mafia. Heath didn't think she would even look at it. And she read A Woman Rides the Beast, she was saved. I meet people all over the world. I got a letter from a woman who said, somebody sent me your book, A Woman Rides a Beast. And she said, my first mistake was reading it. And then she goes on to say what it, uh, the effect it had. She was about to take holy orders. 
And she said, I've stopped going to Mass. I've stopped going to confession. And my, my father confessor weeps over me. And I don't know what to do. And then the last sentence in her, in her letter was, your book haunts me. And we had correspondence with her for a number of months. And finally she wrote to me and she said, will you pray for me that God will help me to do what's right? And again, I think sometimes we have to be blunt. I wrote back to her and I said, I will not pray for you that God will help you to do what's right. You know what is right. And you are responsible to do it. I got a letter back from her. My dearest Dave Hunt, how I appreciated what you said and telling me that she had come to Christ. Okay, so we have to love people enough to sometimes confront them, but at least to give them the truth, the word of God by which they can be born again. And the power is in the blood of Christ, and the power is in the word of God that tells us about it. And this is the gospel. This is the power of God into salvation. And let us not compromise. Let us not dance around the, the, the fringes, but let us come to the point and explain very clearly what the Word of God says, and then we will leave it to God to cause His Word to bear fruit. I came out of a store one day in a, a town in Texas, and there was a horse there, and I made the mistake of commenting what a beautiful horse it was, the next thing I knew they had me on it with a cowboy hat on my head, not to ride it, but just to take a pic my picture. Well. That was fine, but when the flash went off, up went the horse's rear, up went the front of the horse, up went the middle of the horse. And fortunately, there was one of these little horns on there. And I'm hanging on for dear life, but I'm not a rodeo rider. And I got thrown. And I survived that, but my left foot was caught in the stirrup. And here are these hoofs pounding away. All I can do is scream for help. Fortunately, the Walmart manager heard me and ran out and pulled the plug. I'm just showing you how easily you can be deceived. Uh, dear brother Bubar, here he is complaining about his memory. Well, we've got to get down to business, but that reminds me about the old gentleman, you know. And a friend walked, uh, not a friend, a, a stranger walked up to him and said, My name is George. What's your name? Uh, do you have to know right now? <laughs> and... Uh, so the gentleman said, well, I think you got memory problems. I could recommend a course for you. So he started taking the course, and an elderly friend some months later heard that he'd been taking this memory course. He said, oh, I hear you've been taking a memory course. How is it? Oh, fantastic. It really improved your memory? Oh, you, yes, the difference between day and night. You learn how to make associations and so forth. So his friend said, well, I've been having some memory problems. Maybe I ought to take that course. What was the name of it? Um, what's that plant? It's got a long stem with thorns on it and a flower on the end. The man says, oh, you mean a rose? Yeah, a rose. He turns to his wife and says, Rose, what was the name of that memory course? <laughs> now, you see, I'm not such a grim person after all, am I? I heard something that um, kind of saddened me a bit this morning. I heard that some people are not coming to my meetings because they don't like what I've said about certain people. Can you imagine that? And I, I, I well, I can't. And, and I said to the person, what have I said? I have quoted a few people. But I don't know why you should hold me accountable for what the people said that I've quoted. It's like I was at, I was speaking at um, First Baptist Church in Dallas. And we had a Q&A session. Uh, somebody asked me a question about Robert Schuller. And so I, I mentioned uh, a few things. I said, you know, Robert Schuller went to Unity Church of Christianity, their headquarters in Lee Summit, Missouri. Unity is one of the worst cults out there. They deny everything in the Bible. They're into yoga and reincarnation and psychic powers and and so forth. And Robert Schuller went there not to correct them, but to commend them and to teach this cult his church growth principles. And he was speaking to ministers and ministers in training. 
and they had a question and answer time. The questioner said, we've heard a lot, and I give you the verbatim quote and, and selection of Christianity from a tape which I acquired there, but if you went there today, they would deny that he was ever there, and you wouldn't get the tape. Some people are not honest. Uh, they said, well, we hear a lot about the New Age movement these days, and of which we're all a part, the questioner said, and in your opinion, what is the function of a minister in the New Age? Robert Schuller didn't skip a beat. He didn't deny that they, they were all part of the New Age movement. He said, well, in this age, what we have to do is positivize religion. Now, he said, that's easy for you, being unity ministers, because you're already very positive, but you understand I deal with people out there that you would call fundamentalists. And they use terms like sin and guilt and repentance and redemption. And we have to positivize these. And a gentleman came up to me afterwards and he said, I liked everything you said today except what you said about Robert Schuller. I said, what did I say about Robert Schuller? I quoted what Robert Schuller said. So maybe you don't like what Robert Schuller said any more than I do. Please don't get upset at me if I quote what someone said, if I quoted James Dobson, right out of Focus on the Family magazine, who said, Christian psychology is a wonderful profession for any young person to go into, provided their faith is strong enough to withstand the humanism to which they will be exposed. I didn't say that, he said that. Now, if you don't like me to quote him, why did he put it in a magazine? He wasn't ashamed of it. And hundreds of thousands of people have read it. Now, why wouldn't it be legitimate for me to quote that? And if I quoted James Dobson, who had Gary Collins on the radio with him, and they said that psychology is based upon the five basic principles of secular humanism, don't get angry with me. I'm only quoting one. Oh, but you shouldn't say that. He said it on the radio. Aren't you entitled to know what he said? And he wasn't ashamed to say it, so I don't quite understand why anyone should get upset if I quote someone. Now, I could give you some other quotes from Robert Schuller. Here's a verbatim quote. Dave Hunt is a devil. You can see the serpent in his eyes. <laughs> That's a verbatim quote. That's what he told a pastor who told him that I was gonna be speaking at his church. I don't say things like that about anyone. I was on the radio in Seattle and the talk show host said, would you like to hear what Robert Schuller just said about you? I said, well, I don't know whether I want to hear it or not. And so anyway, they played it. He had been for a book signing in Seattle at a bookstore, and they had asked him what he thought about me in a book that I had just written, The Seduction of Christianity, which I said J. Vernon McGee was promoting and giving out wherever he went. And this is Robert, what Robert Schuller said. I think it's satanic, I think it's demonic, it's a work of the devil, it's literally that, and the guy who wrote it doesn't know what he's talking about, he's got one motive in life, and that's bucks. I don't say things like that about anybody. I quote what they said, and let it speak for itself, and I don't think you should be upset if I quote what somebody says. Okay, I was on a panel with Walter Martin before his death, and at a conference on cults. And I mentioned what Robert Schuller had said at Unity headquarters there in Lee Summit, Missouri. And Walter turned to me and he said, Dave, I don't want you to hear you say that again. Because I met with Robert Schuller and I confronted him about his association with Unity. By the way, Robert Schuller had dedicated a Unity temple in Warren, Michigan. You want to write to a Baptist pastor there? who had warned him not to come, but anyway. And um, Walter said, and I confronted Robert Schuller about his association with unity and so forth, and, and he promised that he's not gonna be involved. I said, well, you know, I have met with a number of these people and they say one thing in private. But anyway, I said, okay. Well, a few months later, I'm driving in my car and I turned on the Bible Answer Man, and it's the voice of Walter Barton. And he's saying, and the next thing I knew, Robert Schuller is back to unity. <laughs> and now he won't respond, he won't return my phone calls or answer my letters. Okay, I don't think we should say, don't confuse me with facts, my mind is made up. I think we should be open. And by the way, if I say anything, if I have said anything or say anything that is not true, that is not kind, that is not biblical, 
that is quoted out of context or whatever, please tell me. Because I have about 28 books out there in 45 languages all over the world, and I'm not in the business of misquoting people. And so if I'm saying anything that isn't accurate, please let me know. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, we stand in awe of you and of your word. We tremble before you, Lord, because we are nothing. And it is by your grace and mercy that you have saved any of us. And Father, we cry out to you for not just for Roman Catholics, but for so many who even call themselves evangelical Christians, perhaps, or Protestants, who do not know you. They have never really been born of the, of the word of truth. Uh, they have some kind of an emotional attachment to Jesus, but they don't understand the gospel. And Father, we cry out to you for them, and we ask that you would help us to be faithful to you and to your word and that we might win them to Christ before it's too late. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is TheBereanCall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24-7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.